the graveyard shift of the IGF. It's the end of the end. And anybody who is online with us and anybody who's here in presence, I will give props to, to particularly to, to my friends here, Claudio and Maria for being here. Thank you both as well for being here. So what is this project? This is something that has I have been developing in my consultancy for the past year and a half. Uh, it is an attempt to bridge between internet governance and health. And why is that necessary? Because we attempted to make a lot of different panels at the IGF about health, and we were not finding a lot of traction. Wouldn't you say that, Ron? <laughs> were we from your audience? <laughs> yeah, I'd say that. I'd say that's the polite way of putting it. Indeed, yeah, it's a, it's one of those topics that is uh, really really important, um, but it's one of those topics that's also uh, often so misunderstood that people aren't sure where to jump in. Yeah, that's exactly that. So, with the help of Lacnic Freedom, which is a fund from from Lacnic to develop new projects, I was able to, to develop a bit of a what I hope is a basis for us to deal with this matter. So. Without further delay, uh, what is this exactly, right? Uh, what are we looking into? This is a tool that we are attempting to bridge internet governance and health. It's supposed to be a bit of a blueprint for that. And what was our scope? The LAC region, which is huge. Usually people only research Latin America, but here we added the Caribbean as well. And the goal is basically to inform policymakers on what are the approaches that can be taken? What kinds of policies can we actually engage with to work with health? And our sources are very interesting. It's a, <laughs> it's a mishmash of a lot of things. So if you look here, yes, we have plenty of official sources, but for many countries in Latin America, and this is a reality in the developing world, you just have to go out there and really look for different things. So we used anything from laws and executive orders, which are very formal, all the way to communiques and even tweets from governments. So some governments in Latin America publish their policy decisions via tweets or via Facebook posts. And that had to be, at the end of the day, some of our canonic sources. And that's the kind of thing that really puts into perspective the kind of gaps that we see uh, when it comes to health. Uh, Ron, you, you, you come from Canada, it's way more systematized, but uh, it, would you say that health legislation is taken super seriously or is it a matter that people give less importance than it should be? Yeah, I think, I think uh, as, we, as we move from uh, country to country, uh, every nation has its own set of protocols, rules and, and so forth. Unfortunately, in the global north, we're more advanced in than we are in the global south. And so in the global south, you know, we do see the situation that you're quite well aware of, um, where you have your, um, you're in a situation where you're, you, people get on a bus and they will share with others on that bus, they have a bottle of medicine in their hands and they're willing to sell them at, at one tablet per person. Um, whereas in Canada, it's coming from a prescription environment uh, and it's a much more um, controlled and organized uh, system. But the fact is we are really living in this, you know, accelerated change and, uh, you know, technology is driven by low cost computing, technology is driven by um, access, to the access to medicines in across the border that was never there before. So I think that um, the good news is it's moving in the right direction, but it's not necessarily moving as fast as one would like to see. Yeah, that's my view. You mentioned something incredibly valid, which is exactly that we see in some developing countries exactly the situation. People go into the bus and buy one unit of one specific medicine. It's something we see here in Africa as well from exchanging with our friends. We've had um, an, a Nigerian specialist in medicine in, in one of our previous panel. So it's a situation that we see across the developing world that it's not exactly, you know, ideal. And in our sources, this is very much reflected, how much this is too hodgepodge, how much this is thrown together. It's not something that is really being taken as seriously as people's health would deserve that to be taken seriously. So we started this research with four questions that we were hoping to answer, and I'll go through them if you don't mind. So 
What is the legal situation of the country regarding telemedicine? And importantly, if it is legal, who has access to that? Second question is, does the country allow the purchase of medicines using the internet? Under what circumstances? So basically, can you get on a website and order medication that you need? Third, does the country allow personal importation of medicines using the internet? Under what circumstances? And this is a topic in which my friend Ron is a specialist. It is about you getting medicine from somewhere that's not your country because A, it's cheaper, okay? Or B, because it's not legal in your country to have that medicine, even though your provider has said this is what will save your life, right? And finally, what is the price of certain key drugs in the country and how do these prices compare to other countries in the region? This is another thing that we have observed with, this, with, with all of this research. Sometimes you have neighboring countries with 200% difference in price, 300% difference in price for the same medicine, same compound, same maker. How come? It's medicine. Everybody needs that. People need to be safe. People need to be kept alive. And yet, why is that, there that difference? I wonder, Ron, if you could speak a little bit about your, your experience getting those medicines from Canada to the US and what does that situation look like? Because that's the developed world and it's a scary prospect. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's a very scary prospect because as you can, if you, as you just said, it, this is happening in, a, in between nations and governments that are a little bit more um, further down the road in terms of having organized these things. Let's put it that way. At the end of the day, what's really frustrating is that uh, we have two sets of rules. One set of rules that governments and uh, administrative authorities look at in terms of what you can do and what you cannot do. And another set of rules that uh, the gatekeepers, the internet gatekeepers are managing on, beha on our behalf, on our behalf um, mutual behalf as it were. Basically where the gatekeepers are saying, well, the rules are that uh, you cannot advertise a Canadian uh, pharmacy uh, if it's an internet pharmacy on uh, the US viewed websites that people would ac access from the United States. Uh, however, a rogue pharmacy can come in and it can put umlauts over the O and it can put a couple of dashes and accents around E's and I's, uh, which are obviously, uh, it's an obviously fake uh, advertisement and yet they're able to advertise. So we're really between a rock and a hard place here. And unless there's some kind of a agreement by the internet community, whether they be uh, the, what we'll call the, the plumbers, the guys who provide all of the infrastructure or whether they be on the policy side from um, just the community as a whole, until we get to a place where that has been developed, uh, we're gonna have this continued uh, disparity where actually um, instead of doing the right thing, a lot of the gatekeepers are just allowing those advertisers, those rogue advertisers to, to advertise their products. Uh, Xanax, uh, no prescription, for example. Um, these are really, really deadly drugs that can, mis misuse could be uh, quite a serious, have quite serious impact. So um, it's really important that we get some traction and we get some uh, real movement toward standards and norms. Uh, on a internet basis, because once that happens, I believe that uh, governments and administrations will follow that lead. That's my hope. Yeah, and this is a problem in the global north. So what did we get based on everything that Ron just said and the research that they do in the north? What we thought was, what does this look like in the global south? Because if it's this stuff up there where it's overly regulated, there's a lot of interest in the pharma industry. How does it look? in our Latin American region, right? And it's the thing, why does it matter, right? We started looking at the, at the literature and some scary things come to be and they're logical, but we don't think about them, right? If people need medicine and they cannot afford it, what do they do? They go look for cheaper alternatives, right? And you bump into this statistic, one in 10 medicine is circulating on the internet are of inferior quality or counterfeit. So there's a one in 10 chance that in this search for something cheaper, they will end up with something that may seriously harm their health or kill them. So this is something that's pretty scary in my view. 
because we are not doing our due diligence. As Ron mentioned, there's pharmacy out there, there's rogue pharmacies. These are operations that are global, generally acting from two certain countries. Uh, and what do they do? They use every tool available in the Internet Governance Toolkit, right? They do search engine optimization. They do use the, the DNS, the domain name system, in a malicious way to try to get it across, like Ron said, by changing their name slightly and pretending to be a website, by phishing credentials, all kinds of things. And at the end of the day, what do they do? Once they get a credential of a person, once that person is in their database, every month they come back and call the person and go like, hey, your prescription ran out, you need more. And they keep pushing this medicine that may be insufficient, it may be laced with something addictive so that the person will keep on getting only that medicine from them, or it may be outright something poisonous. So this is not a good look, and this is why we think it matters. So what's the situation, right? Uh, in the internet governance field, every time we try to bring this, this, this topic, it doesn't attract much attention. This session is a reflection of that, but, well, we are in the graveyard shift, but broadly, there is no interest, right? People seem to look at health as if it is something minor or, or tangential, even though we just came out of a global pandemic. So, you know, the internet keeps growing during the entire pandemic it grew, and it is something we need to be looking into. At least that's our idea or why we are doing this. So in fact, Mark, in fact, it. Mark, if I could just, if I can just share that, uh, you know, when you talk about the pandemic, um, we found that statistically, uh, you know, we've, we've watched a lot of different surveys and research coming out. And uh, basically, you know, Americans across all demographics were purchasing medicine online during the, uh, during the pandemic. And in fact, um, they were doing it, you know, 60% were saying it was because of the uh, convenience and, uh, and the 56% were saying it was because of cost. At the end of the day, uh, people are going online looking for these things. There's absolutely no doubt about it. The question is, where is the source of the information they're getting? Uh, is that a safe and trusted place or not? And so that's what we're seeing here. Uh, the pandemic really amped things up. Yeah, and, and thinking about that, right, we saw a lot of miracle cures as well. Websites exactly. pretending like they could cure COVID-19. We saw all, all kinds of stuff, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's like, when we stop to look and consider all these things, we looked at all of these countries which constitute most of Latin America and the Caribbean. Unfortunately, some nations in the Caribbean are so small that it's almost impossible to get data on them. But still, we went for most of it. And the results we have are pretty interesting. I will discuss them briefly and Ron will, will help me out with some comments about this. So what does it look like in terms of telemedicine? After the pandemic, as you can see, a lot became legal. There's plenty of countries that approved their telemedicine laws in 2020, 2021 or something. Some were ahead of the curve and had already been making it legal for the past decade, but we still have countries to this day in which what we call the gray area. What is a gray area? You don't have specific laws. When you don't have specific laws, what happens is you don't know. The, predic the practitioner may not be safe, the, the doctor may not be safe, and the patient may not be safe, depending on the procedure. And this is not happening exactly in, only in very small countries, right? You have countries like Honduras, you know, still gray area. You have countries where we said it's mostly legal, like Ecuador, it's a major country in Latin America, mostly legal because we, it appears to be legal, right? Guatemala, you know, the, the Guiana, it appears to be legal. But what does it mean for the patient and for the practitioner when you say that something appears to be legal? It probably means that if something goes wrong, you don't have the correct backing to actually either do this in a, in a manner that's good for everyone, in a manner that makes sense, in a way that the, both parties are protected. And I think that's, you know, pretty risky. Um, do you have an opinion on that one, Ron? 
Well, actually, I'm wondering how that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm impressed by the depth of research and, the, and your sources. Um, we smiled about that before, the fact that, you know, the, the, there's not that much research that's uh, black on white necessarily and in files. You have to go look for it and you find it even in tweets. Um, but at the end of the day, I wanted to know what your um, general view is on the chart that you have for, uh, for Latin America versus what you might see in other global south parts of the world, Africa, for example. Would you, what's your experience in, in that? Uh, this chart you're showing us now, is it similar, different, or something in between? So just as a joke, I got this exact first column to try to gather data from Africa. And turns out it's even harder, <laughs> which was, you know, scary because this honestly took a year to compile. And looking forward, looking ahead of this as, as a model, even charting the legality of telemedicine in Africa is looking like a massive effort. It's something that we would need to get really multiple people involved. It can be a research as small as this one. And that's the thing. The, what does this look like in the developing world in general? You hit the, yeah. the nail in the that's head, good. right? It, it was difficult for Latin America. For Africa, like or, or the, our first pilots didn't even look like a thing. We would really need to partner with a lot of people. So it's scary, right? I'm looking yeah. at a table that's incomplete and there's tables that may be even more incomplete. Right, that's the thing. And if you look at the second one, th this, this is the scary one for me, local medicine purchased with the internet. So when you look at that, you will see, for example, there's a country that says straight up illegal. What that means is you log into the internet, you need a medicine, you try to purchase it, you can't. You literally are not allowed by law to do that. You have to get out of your house. What if you're elderly, immunosuppressed? What if you're locking down from COVID? What if any of that is true? Well, that's your problem. You deal with it. You're not allowed by law to do it. And we also bumped into places that are apparently illegal. And then there are, again, those gray areas. And gray areas are, are scary things when you think about online purchases of medicine, because who has the, the actual burden there? Right? What are we looking into? Is it about the, the person who is selling? Is it the person who is receiving? Where is the responsibility there? Does the country actually guarantee anything about that medicine? Right? So when we, see, when we saw so many gray areas and those that are mostly allowed, what do we call mostly allowed? It is, we think, putting together laws, tweets, Facebook posts. It looks like it might be legal to do it. But is that the kind of assurance we want to give people who just came out of a pandemic? <laughs> there may be other pandemics. There may be all kinds of situations. Is that something that we are trying to, to say is, is a good place to be in, right? So this is one of the scariest notions that came out of this research that over half of Latin America, we cannot say for sure that the person can go in, purchase a medicine, and call that a legal act, right? What about the people who can't? <laughs> what do you think, Ron? <laughs> well, no, well, so this, this really comes down, back down to that core decision uh, from a nation's point of view. Uh, is, it, is this, are we going to abide by a law that was written at some point in time when the internet was never as prevalent as it is today? Uh, or are we going to uh, abide more from a compassionate point of view? What's the more more appropriate view for how we deal with our citizenry, uh, <coughs> pardon me, in a nation? And I think that uh, it's too easy for uh, governments, law enforcement to say, okay, here's our hard and fast rule, that's it. Because for when it comes to enforcement, uh, those officers of the law are really doing their job, but the job is uh, unfortunately um, not keeping up with the times. And so we had a session some years ago here at IGF and one of our panelists talked about, he asked a couple of questions and one of them was, um, if I go to another country and I go into a pharmacy and I can buy medicine that I need at a lower cost, uh, and I buy a three-month subscription and come home, have I broken the law? 
have I done something really wrong? I bought the same medication that I'm being prescribed by my doctor. I've taken that into another country and that in that country, their pharmacy has reviewed that, reviewed my, um, my medical history, and, uh, and then they prescribed that product for me to use for my health. Uh, is that against the law? And then if I come across the border, is it appropriate that um, customs uh, should take that away from me because under their rules, I'm not supposed to be bringing that into the country? Now, within the Canada United States situation, a 90 day prescription of a, a medicine uh, based on a prescription uh, that's been fulfilled by a pharmacist meets all the requirements. But the fact of the matter is you still have these situations where I might uh, order that by mail and it may not show up in my mailbox, but it's medicine that I truly need. And as a result of that being caught in the mail because it doesn't meet uh, arcane rules from a time where the internet was not nearly as prevalent as it is today, uh, is really uh, not necessarily the benchmark that we want to be pushing out to a global community. What we should be doing is establishing something that's much more standardized and provides the levels of safety uh, and security. You talked about earlier about uh, falsified medicines or substandard medicines. Uh, that's a really serious uh, issue uh, because if I'm a doctor prescribes a specific amount of medication I should take every day, I need to take that every day if that's going to improve my health. I can't be taking something substandard thinking I'm going to find my way out of that uh, particular uh, circumstance. So it's, it, it is really a, a difficult, difficult situation to address, um, particularly because the growing number of people buying medicine online just like I can buy a car online. Um, that's a, a serious uh, investment, serious, a lot of thought given to it and so forth. So I can go and find that. Why can I not get my maintenance medications? Because we're not talking about opioids here. We're not talking about uh, medicines that need to be kept frozen uh, for a particular period of time, those types of things. We're talking about maintenance medications, my blood pressure or whatever that might be that uh, individuals need. So this is the tricky part that we're we're really dealing with right now. Yeah, I, I think you you hit it right in the head. Like, who has control over this? Governance, basically, because we are not discussing it. We are not pushing any kind of policy in any forum to advance these questions. So even though it is a thing that I think we have proven is important, we are not discussing it anywhere. We are not advancing the discussion of how to make this legal for everyone. And then we where the discussion is happening, right. Mark. If I might jump on that part, go for me for interrupting. Where that conversation is happening, it's happening in a in a closed echo chamber. It's happening with, exactly. you know, the FDA in the room and uh, lobbyists in the room and a number of people in the room because they have a specific outcome that they would like to see passed in some some type of legislation. But the actual consumers uh, and those who are serving those those in need of those med medicines, they're not in the room to have that participate in that conversation. So it really is a closed loop that they're having that conversation in. And that's very frustrating. I think uh, you, you're right uh, that we have to find a way, but we can't find a way unless we actually have people in the room that want to find a solution as opposed to wanting to stop, uh, just stop all activity in terms of using the internet for application to your medicines. Uh, to say it's all rogue is really sticking your head in the sand like an ostrich. That's that happens to be the current case and the current situation we live in. So I apologize for jumping on you, but it was an important point I wanted to get out. No, that, that's exactly it. You, you, you correct me in the, in the best way possible. People are discussing this. It's just not us. It's just not the people who are actually affected by it. It's just it's basically the companies or uh, and a few legislators. So when we come to the final part of the table here, personal medicine importation, this is where things get tricky. Like this, this is tricky as hell. Right, like you can see that this is where the unknown starts, and and this unknown is very scary because it means like literally there's no rule. So okay, you have a disease, you have to import a medication to treat that disease. Can you? I don't know. And we literally dug very deep, right? It's not like we were doing superficial research. We were looking everywhere, everywhere, and there's no law saying whether you can do that. In a lot of countries in a very vast region and even in important countries I'm, I'm saying like every country, country is important but countries that have a massive size there you go you don't know and in some of them okay it's allowed but then we got thinking 
what does allowed mean? Allowed is a very tricky word, right? It's, it's incredibly tricky. You can say, yeah, this is allowed, but we started digging into how many procedures do you have to go through to be able to get that medicine? And that's when it gets super tricky because in some countries, okay, medium difficulty, you'll spend like three months going after that. In, in other countries, straight up, it wouldn't take less than a year, right? So you need this medicine for today. You can't afford to, this is where it comes, it becomes a social thing because if you're rich, you can fly to the country, get the medicine and come back. Great, you're saved. If you're even middle class, you can't exactly do that, can't you? So why don't you go to an online pharmacy and get the medicine you need delivered to you? Well, can you? Unknown, very difficult, allowed but difficult. Then it starts to get really tricky, right? Because when you look at prices here, we did some price comparison and in some countries, and this is the Latin American region alone, right? You have a disparity of price of as much as 171% more for the same medicine, same brand, same composition, same everything. So even if it's not a medicine that's not allowed, is it really fair that somebody has to pay 171% more than their neighboring country instead of being able to just buy it from the internet, right? <laughs> we have Airbnb, we have Uber, we have all of these things, but medicines are mystical. So this table is kind of the, the general outcome of the research, right? It's a, it's a look and it's something that we, we are hoping we'll be able to inspire other people or even ourselves to look into other places. Ron asked the question, right, what does this look like in Africa? That's a big, big question we have. Through the entire week, we've been asking people from the region, like, do you know about this? And the answer is generally, no, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know my rights. Can I, can't I? Like, these are questions that we are not asking. And that's why we feel that this is an important research that maybe can be replicated in other places. The market research is that the, the, in terms of pricing, there's always the interesting aspect that one can address and say, well, you know, every market uh, has its own uh, price tolerance. Therefore, you know, a Mercedes Benz that I buy in Germany versus a Mercedes Benz that I buy in uh, Miami, Florida versus the Mercedes Benz I buy when I'm in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, each market has its own issues. Uh, obviously, uh, in the sense of um, emissions and, uh, you know, different various aspects that might be with that vehicle. But the vehicle itself is the same car. And so you would wonder about market pricing and you say, okay, I can understand that perhaps it might be a little less to buy that car in Brazil because that economy might be not as uh, hot as the U.S. economy, as an example. So therefore, the same car might cost $20,000 more in the United States than it does in Brazil. Uh, so I can understand that dynamic of pricing, but you know, when it comes to medicine, um, medicine is, you know, it's, it's chemical compounds put together. There's not a lot of different elements that one might put into the pills in Brazil versus the pills in Canada. Uh, and that is the point, right? <clears throat> That's the point, whether or not, you know, the affordability of medicines or the availability of medicines. So I think it's really important what you're touching on here. It's not just about access. It's about the cost because I may be able to buy it in my country, but the price is just so outrageous. I can't afford it. Uh, and that's why I'm going across or going outside of my country to get it. Now, I shouldn't have to physically do that. I shouldn't have to take my person outside the country to do it. I should be able to go online and figure out how to do that in a more safe way. Yeah, or in other words, does the suffering of someone from a country, does a person suffer less in a country than the other for not having a medicine? Yeah, right? exactly. Like, is, they yeah, don't, obviously. Right? Is their suffering like somehow cheaper or, or more expensive? That, that's the real question, right? And when exactly. thinking about that, right, how do we bring this into internet governance? This is where the, 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 the academic part starts. But I'll try not to make it boring because it's rather simple. There's this area called health policy and systems research, and it's surprisingly similar to internet governance, like way more than you would think. They're all about multi-stakeholder collaboration and all the things that we talk about here, 
It's the same for them. They talk about crossing lines. They talk about including policymakers, stakeholders, industry. And, you know, in doing that research, you just see, start to see that there's, hey, there's another multi-stakeholder field that's also much like ours that could be intersecting with ours, but it isn't. Why? Well, I will venture to say nobody's trying. So this is the attempt, right? They are essentially very similar and they, they fall into this thing that we call like the polycentric systems of governance, which is basically what we do here, right? We have competing interests, but at some point we have to bring them together. We have to make the, those interests meet so that we can actually progress. And that's the thing. If we have two fields that are so similar, there are potentially ways to approach them. There are potentially ways to make them work as a single thing. It's just not being done. It's just not being researched. So where do we start, right? We thought of three points where we could start from. So access to telemedicine and telehealth, that's good. For those of you who don't know the, the distinction, telemedicine is like you get into the phone and your doctor talks to you and telehealth is you perform the entire um, kind of consultation, the entire thing, uh, the entire procedures on the internet or, or online or digitally. Also the sale of medicines through online pharmacies and something that's more common every day, which is the exchange of medical data. All of those fields, very viable to research, but as we were talking, the matter of rogue pharmacies just stands out a lot, right? It's, it's very tangible, right? It's very tangible. We have these actors using the internet to sell very bad things, usually to elderly people. That's usually their target for their scams. And this doesn't look like something that we would find very allowable, right? It's not the kind of thing that we would think to ourselves, yeah, let's use the internet for that. So why exactly are we not combating that? Why exactly are we being so lenient with these actors? I don't see a reason for that. I don't see exactly why we are not being more combative against them because they make use of all of the things that we are trying to protect here, the DNS system, the IP system, everything that we are fighting to, 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 to do, they make use of that. They sell from their country to another country. So in terms of jurisdiction, they are, they are sure being able to do in transnational sale of medicines that are theoretically legal, but here they're doing really in an illegal manner and they're rich. Right? They have a lot of money. There, there's a lot of money behind that. So if you shut down like one, they can spawn another one the next day. Easy. That's no problem for them. That's the kind of pattern we see. Even if we try very hard to shut down like this online pharmacy, we know it's rogue. It's selling people very bad stuff. Okay, we take them down. Next day, new one. Doesn't matter. To them, it's just a, it's, it's more of a game, right? So the, the key thing here is... You would think this is done in secret, but it's not. That's the, the, one of the most worrisome things from our research. 40% of the traffic that these websites receive comes from search engines. Google, Bing, Yahoo, Baidu. So it's not like people are exactly going out of their way to find something secret or, or find some secret club or going to the dark net. No, no, no. They look up on Google and they find the pharmacy and get there. Is that what we want? I don't think it is what we want. Uh, it's just a matter of this subject is not talked about seriously or systematically. And we end up with this blind spot where we're just not discussing these questions, right? And here comes like the, the big diagram. And here, if people want to start chatting back to us, this is a good point to start chatting back to us. Um, what is this, right? This is an oversimplification of what things look like. But I guess you can kind of follow it. Here's the seller. He's trying to peddle his illegal drugs. If it is on the dark net or, or on crypto, we're screwed. We have no, no governance over that. But lucky for us, they're using Google, right? <laughs> they're using the web. So it's not like that, that really matters for us right now. So you have the platforms. And those are complicated 
because apps like TikTok is now the, the go-to in terms of apps, right? People buy fentanyl, which is an opioid. They buy opioids through TikTok. And, you know, the company behind it doesn't seem to care that much. How do we actually affect the policies around that? How do we tell them, hey, you probably shouldn't be allowing the sale of opioids in your platform? Do we have a mechanism to do that? Potentially, right? This is... These are the points of intervention where this research would lead towards. How do we intervene in a platform, right? This is something that I think we, it's still a little uncharted for us as a community. We still don't know that, right? But this line above it, this one we kind of know. This is kind of in our wheelhouse. So IP addresses, DNS, registry, registrar, host, web and email, right? This is the kind of things that we're discussing here. They're structural to this problem. And there are multiple points where we can act. So out of, uh, uh, out of fun, Ron, wh where would you start acting in the chain? Like what would be your kind of starting point? <laughs> out of fun. I wish it were <clears throat> out of fun, but I, the reality is that my experience is, is, has seen that it's the, uh, the, the gatekeepers. And when I say gatekeepers, I'm talking about the platforms, whether they be you know, TikTok or whether they be Google or others, uh, Instagram, um, whether these guys would follow a path that would be a, a path that's to the betterment of society or they're happy to follow the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance is basically uh, following along with section 230. Uh, that's existing in the United States uh, legislation now that basically says that uh, none of the gatekeepers are responsible for anything that shows up on their sites, on their platform. Um, that, that's an oversimplification of that legislation, but that's the reality of it, is that they have no, uh, nothing that can be done to them uh, that is uh, detrimental. So we are seeing that uh, creation of new um, associations of all of the various uh, parties in the chain of distribution of medicines uh, coming together with very you know, philosophical names, uh, associations for safe online pharmacy and these types of things uh, who are really uh, just trying to stay very close to Section 230 and make sure that none of that gets, gets uh, tampered with because that's the path they've been able to skirt all of these issues on until now. Um, coming back to your chart, uh, you know, the issue, the DNS is, uh, as I've come to understand over this last couple of years, in particular with all of the research that we're talking about, DNS abuse, um, <clears throat> it's a very specific structure. And sometimes it's like, the, the way it's explained to me is, you know, looking at the DNS and trying to solve the abuse problem with registries and registrars is kind of taking a sledgehammer to pound in a, a tack, a uh, thumbtack. It's, it's really, you know, a, a, the wrong tool for the wrong place. <clears throat> but I think it's at the hosting level <clears throat> that you're going to find much more capability to reach out to the rogue actors to the bad actors uh, at the hosting level and, and not shut the whole website down, but take them offline uh, until uh, whatever the egregious behavior is has been addressed. So um, for me, it's, the, it's at the hosting provider level where we should be you know, going in with the scalpel, not taking the sledgehammer to pound in the tack at the DNS level, at the DNS stack level. Uh, that's how I see it. Does our audience have an, any opinion? Does, does anybody have an opinion on this? I know it's a tough question, but does anybody have any ideas on how to do with this? I was, I was wondering, thanks, Mark. Claudio Lucena, Paraíba State University. Thanks a lot for all this enlightenment, Ron. Uh, I, was, I was looking here, you have a, a stakeholder, uh, you have a, a, a roadmap of where to act, but it's not necess it not necessarily tells us who should act connected with that stakeholder. And that was uh, what I was curious about. Uh, it could have been within the research, but I clearly noticed it, it's not in the scope of which stakeholders would be more interested or more likely or more, more well-structured to act. 
but I not having an opinion about the, the map itself you have, but adding a question, who would be the right stakeholder to act whatever, uh, whatever box you decide to start from? Sorry to give, give the question back. No, no. <laughs> uh, would anybody like to add any question or comment on top of Claudio's? Okay, I'll take that. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Lassisi Salami Lawal, I'm from Nigeria. Um, quite interesting. I just want to share with all that you have. Uh, uh, I want to appreciate all that you have shared with us here today. And um, Nigeria as a country has been trying to embrace issues concerning telemedicine. As a matter of fact, I'm a research winner of ITU on Connect to Recover, where we conducted action research on telemedicine to help fast track United Nations uh, <laughs> Sustainable Development Goal 3, which is about health for all. And looking at the digital divide in Africa and looking at the issues of um, the fact that we're just eight, less than eight years away from you know um the sdg code we feel those goals can be achieved without components of e-medicine um, e-health telemedicine so we did a lot in the last six months and also in the mid recommendations to policies i mean recommendations and policies to government to about framework and all of that to actually inculcate and adopt telemedicine right from even teaching hospitals which is absent you see young doctors they know nothing about telemedicine so i think i would want to partner with your team to begin to see issues of uh, framework policies regulations standards that we could adopt or recommend for our environment and in general africa Thank you so much for all that you've done. Thank you. Not only thank you very much, but one of the key people who were kind of fundamenting this with us is exactly from Nigeria. She's a specialist in medicines in Nigeria, and she kind of got us very inspired to start looking into these questions. So it is very, it's actually very fortuitous that, that you, you are here today because it is kind of where we got the idea but I kind of started from my region. I'm like, okay, I'll see here first. But clearly from everything she, she brought to us, all the experience that, that she brought to us, we're like, okay, this is a bit of a problem. <laughs> this is a bit of a problem, right? Like we, we, we as the, the global South are not ready in the same way that the global North is, but not in the questions that we're usually talking about. It's not like, Oh, access to this and that. No, it's about this basic thing called health that we just got hammered by this past few years. So uh, it, it, this is actually fortuitous. And answering to, to, to Professor Claudio, that's exactly the thing that, I, that we were hoping we would find out. Ooh, how, where do we go with this? And uh, as one of our, of our researcher friends would say, uh, how does Aria put it, Ron? Where's the... Who's the convener? Who's the, Who convener? the convener? Thank Who's you. the convener? Exactly. Who's the convener? Right? And we spent two years researching that, and the answer is, um, if we want that answer, we have to do way more research. That's the thing about this incipient field of, of trying to bring health and internet together. We found out that people are so uninterested in this, and this is what's scary. This is why we... We're trying to bring this to the IGF because we're like, okay, somebody must have answered this. And the answer is no. <laughs> and, and it's super difficult when you have to consider the fact that um, the research is so incipient that we don't have a mechanism. We can't go to the who. We tried uh, to look, okay, the who, right? World Health Organization seems like a good place. No, they don't deal with internet. They barely understand the internet exists. Scary, very scary. You go like, oh, governments. Then we bump into the, the table that, that we were showing in which some governments don't even have legislation for the sale of medicines. Okay, this is getting tricky. Okay, maybe we go talk to ICANN. There's absolutely no discussion over at ICANN about 
these rogue pharmacies that are actually murdering people. They're literally murdering people. No discussion there. Where do we look, right? The IGF is great because we get to socialize this, these issues, which is good. But the next step, the next question is, how do we bring this to these different forums? That's the part that is so interesting, but at the same time, very, you know, daring. Uh, we have a, a big community here. We can intervene on all sorts of levels, right? Uh, I wonder if my tech friends could project very small, the table here and me, or me and the table, me and table and me. Thank you very much. <laughs> if, I, if there can be me and the table, would, it, would be great, but let, let me not text you too much. So we can even do this at the IP address level. There are IP blacklists out there that act on the borders of the ASs, but then this is super easy for them to overcome. They just get a, yeah, it's whack-a-mole, right? They, they use the DNS to just call for another IP. So here we're kind of screwed. At the DNS level, that's more interesting, right? The main names are more interesting because they have to keep, keep them alive for a bit. In our research, we found out they keep them alive for like a week to two weeks. The, the ones that stay very long, it's like two months. So that's the frame of action that we have to actually take these pharmacies down. It's a very, very small frame for us to take them down. So if we were to work here, the registry who are the owner of the domain, so the .orgs of the word, they usually don't deal with this. Who would we deal with? It's these guys here, right? Registrars and hosts. They are more here, right? They're more here. If we learn to start complaining fast and effectively to them, potentially we can accomplish something. But we, do we have a framework for that? We don't. So this, that's where advancing internet governance and health system policy research together starts to bear fruit. We can start bringing evidence to these players so that it never gets to this part, so that we don't have to worry about when it goes to search engines, websites, CDNs, email, spam, right? When it gets there, it's already kind of late. We, we, we're already kind of lost. We need to stop them as they're doing these actions. But that would require massive coordination, massive will. So am I here to bring the solution? No, I'm not here to bring the solution. I'm here to bring a table. <laughs> I'm here to bring a, a table. I'm just a researcher, right? I just want to point out that things are very unknown for us in this field yet. We need to start looking at this more systematically and hopefully, you know, um, uh, through the next few years, I currently serve as a GNSO counselor at ICANN. I have been trying to advance those issues there. Hopefully we can do a little more. Hopefully some of you who are players in the industry can do a little bit more, come talk to me. This is supposed to be like something for us to, to talk about, to just kind of expose this research for the first time. And I would like to know if there are any more interventions, questions, or jokes. I'm, I'm taking jokes as well. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint, Mark. I don't have a joke for you. Um, Jennifer Chung, I guess, uh, speaking as Dot Asia. I think I do agree with what Ron said earlier. I mean, as a registry, we have the bluntest instrument. We're not able to do it. We just take it down. And if you're looking at, as you as you pointed out in the flow chart, if you're starting uh, the action at the registrar level, it really does depend on the jurisdiction that they're in. If the laws in that jurisdiction doesn't allow them to act, it's very difficult for them to act. Our registrar friends need a court order or some frame, legal framework for them to be able to act. It's very difficult to ask them to act as judge, jury, and executioner in these matters. I do agree that it does take a lot of different stakeholders to coordinate. It's a shame that we don't have a current framework, but as you said, this is the forum where you start to kind of socialize this idea and get people to take notice. It's a shame also that the who doesn't understand the internet, they should. 
Um, I wanted, I have a question for you now after that comment. I noticed that your table does contain a lot of information for the LAC region. Are you looking to expand your research to other jurisdictions and other regions? Because Asia Pacific region has a lot of um, very gray areas, especially, you know, certain cultures have traditional medicines that also operate in the very gray area and they do you know sell things online and that may not be completely legal so just a question about your research uh, next steps thank you for dovetailing into the perfect question yes we are looking for partners to keep this going <laughs> right a simple answer uh we lack was lacnic was very kind to give us the funds to get this pilot started they really believed in us when nobody else was even believing in this so uh, we're really thankful that that lacnic got us the seed funding so that we could try to prove that, yes, there is a debate involving health and the internet. It is a thing, right? Like, uh, it seems obvious, but you would be befuddled by the amount of no's that we got. We got years of no's before we got somebody to, to believe in us. Are there other actors out there who would want to keep this going, take this to their, their region? That would be beautiful. So if any of you in here or online know of any actor that would like to at least talk about that, yes, we would be very happy to move this forward because we just proved that it kind of exists. This is a thing. Now, where do we go from here? Uh, where, what do you think, Ron? Where do we go from here? Well, <clears throat> there are two things. And I also see Tim Smith from the Canadian International Pharmacy Association has his hand up, so we can probably look to him to get some uh, clear information. But I wanted to uh, just say <clears throat> I'm very hopeful uh, at this point in time that we actually will start to put some meat on the bones, as they say, in on this topic, because both, well, everyone's clear on the technical abuse of the DNS, and now we're also talking about the, uh, the content abuse much more clearly than we've ever spoken before. And so I'm hopeful that with all of this general move towards it, internet jurisdiction are moving in this direction, other major players are moving in this direction to try to actually start coming up with a set of uh, rules by which all the internet players will live and work and act uh, as opposed to waiting for legislations all around the world to harmonize laws on this very topic. So I'm very uh, hopeful that we actually are at this period in time moving in the right direction. And hopefully within a year or two, we might actually see some meat on the bones, some standards, some norms that everyone can agree with uh, from an internet community point of view, saying these all, all these rules make sense. They're more compassionate. They're more understanding of the situation. And um, once we get there, I think that we'll see government administrations start to modify their rules to adapt what we as the internet community have come up with. That's my hope. Anyway, I wanted just to make that uh, comment, and uh, I did see Tim's hand was up, and I know we're coming close on time, so I just mentioned those two things, Mark. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. For Ron has been a, a great mentor and a, and a great supporter of this research. And Tim, please. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Well, uh, and I, I know we're getting short on time. Uh, Ron just touched on the the issue of DNS abuse, and I don't want to go too far down that hole, that rabbit hole. Although, um, when you when you take a look at your chart and the different levels of uh, where the issue could be addressed. Um, you know, there is a lot of discussion, of course, within the ICANN world about malicious and compromised domains. Uh, and I guess, um, uh, you know, if a uh, domain is being used for uh, selling bad drugs, um, falsified and substandard, as we might want to call them, then that might uh, involve intervention at uh, a different level, perhaps at the registrar level. If it's a matter of a compromised domain where a page on a website is being uh, compromised to try to market falsified and substandard drugs, that may be more at the hosting level. Uh, also trademark violation, which is something that we find ourselves faced with from time to time where somebody has taken our trademark, a trusted trademark, uh, and tried to misuse 
use it. That might be appropriately addressed at the hosting level. So I'm, I think you have different types of issues that need to be mapped out as well. But I think uh, probably the first issue that needs to be dealt with, and I, and I think back to the slide that you had early on, Mark, where you um, defined what you call a rogue pharmacy. Um, and there's a whole bunch of uh, different criteria that you throw into being a rogue pharmacy. Uh, and I think the first step is to determine what is it that you're trying to permit, which is access to safe and affordable medicines. And what is it you're trying to restrict, which is the uh, ability for marketers of falsified and substandard and counterfeit drugs. Um, so I think you need to take a step back uh, and first define that clearly what it is you're trying to address uh, before you get to who is it that actually takes action. So uh, I hope that you're going to make that distinction because there are parties such as my organization, the Canadian International Pharmacy Association, that provides what Ron described earlier as a compassionate service for people who can't access or afford the medications where they live. So uh, it very much needs to be defined in, in many ways as you proceed in your uh, research. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Tim. For those not in the know, Tim is like a guru in this area. So it's, it's a pleasure in itself. <laughs> To have him. Uh, thank you so much for that, Tim. Yeah, I think you're you're absolutely correct. The matter of definition is so tough, especially considering that uh, there are areas in which thousands of people are involved and we don't have good definitions. Never mind one that's so incipient, mm -hmm. but it's definitely something we need to be working together on. We have another floor comment here. Thank you. Just a little contribution to what my colleague here just said. And um, as a satellite provider, satellite operator and service provider in um, Africa, I know there's a lot that can be done from um, registry level in addressing the issue of um, online rogue pharmacy, considering from the backdrop of what we do with um, end users when it comes to um, copyright violations, IP, and all of that with Afrinic. Afrinic is the regional continental uh, registrar for number resources in Africa. So we liaise and get our public IP and number resources from there. We escalate a lot in tracing and getting to know who violates issues of copyright. I think the same can be extended to issues of rogue online um, pharmacy. So on that note, not just I'm looking at not just I can. We could also just extend this to regional, you know, uh, yeah, number resource managers and see how we can come up with framework. So like you said, for us as a start level operator, we're also trying to promote um, digital health via start light. We call it S for DH, which is start light for digital health. So that's why I want to be willing to to see what we can do to extend what the good work you're doing to Nigeria in particular, because to be honest, I didn't see any data on Nigeria and I'm not comfortable with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> well, we, we do have to wrap up, but I hope that at least this was enlightening to anybody who was here. At least this got you thinking a little bit more about the subjects. We hope to keep producing uh, research. Um, any data can be found, basically reach me on LinkedIn. Uh, I have a very, very difficult name, so you can find it out on the session name. Uh, and feel free to reach out if you have any, any kind of questions. We, are, we want to keep advancing this with people who are interested. You don't need to be a big player. We just want people who kind of care, like who say, hey, maybe we should be dealing with this. Maybe we don't want our grandparents to be buying fake medicine, medicine laced with opioids. Maybe that's really evil and we want to stop that somehow, right? So uh, before I close, I want to thank very much our friends from tech support back there. It's very late. They have been working all week and they still put a great presentation for us. Thank you so much for the, for the help. It's very appreciated, all your hard work. Thank you for everyone who was here. I know it's late. I know it's the end of the event, but each and everyone here counts. And thank you very much to my, to Ron, my, my great mentor has been working so much. Thanks to Tim, everyone who was online and everyone who was here. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a pleasant end of your IGF and see you soon. Thanks everyone. Safe travels home. <laughs>